Hello everybody and welcome to this our final video on phylogeny where we look at how we take those characters that we described in the last video and how we make them into a phylogeny or a hypothesis of evolution relationships. So this is the process that's called phylogenetic inference. We infer a tree based on our data. And there are two broad schools of how we do so. We'll meet one in detail, and then we will meet the other one uh, relatively briefly in passing. So without further ado, let's look at the first of our approaches, um, which is a thing called parsimony. So parsimony is uh, defined on the slide for you here. This is in cladistic analysis, the convention whereby the simplest explanation is preferred because it requires the fewest conjectures, although the most parsimonious explanation may not always be the best one, or the correct one, we should say. So this is a um, conceptually fairly simple approach, which has been used to build morphological trees for a very long time. It was used for a long time as well to, to build molecular trees, but it's very rarely used to build um, molecular phylogenies nowadays because there are known, um, I guess, flaws in the process that lead to artifacts that are incorrect, that we, we know are incorrect when we're using this to build um, molecular phylogenies. And this is something that actually builds on an axiom that was mentioned or created by a, uh, well, first formalised, I suppose I should say, by a dude called William of Ockham in the uh, 13th century that said multiplicity ought not to be posited without necessity, i.e. the simplest answer is the best. So in a phylogenetic context, what this really means is that what we want if we're building a tree is the tree shape, that's sometimes called the topology of the tree, that requires the fewest character changes. So the tree shape is basically just the arrangement of the tips of the tree um, that we call the tree topology, and the shortest we call the most parsimonious tree. So, or the MPT, I may use that um, shorthand in the future, so apologies if I forget to say what it is later in this video. And we need to be aware that in any given phylogenetic analysis, some characters are going to contradict each other. That reflects the fact that homoplasy is real. Some characters don't always reflect evolutionary history. A very good example here is warm-bloodedness. We have a warm-blooded chicken and we have a warm-blooded mouse. But the last common ancestor of the chicken and the lizard we think was probably not warm-blooded, so this must have evolved twice independently in those two lineages. So this is a homoplastic character. However, if we were to rearrange the tree so the chicken is most closely uh, related to the mouse, then actually a load of these other characters would have to, have to evolve twice. So the way parsimony essentially works is we favor this tree shape because taking all of the characters together, this implies the fewest number of changes, even though because that by doing so, it does imply that there's a homoplastic evolution of warm-bloodedness in two of the lineages. But overall, the data is telling us that that is convergent. And that's how a parsimony uh, tree inference works. So in the details, um, uh, we kind of, uh, we, we need to look at this in, uh, in a kind of a fairly computational um, context. And that's because working out the shortest tree um, is actually really quite challenging computationally. With a small number of characters, we can just figure this out manually. So on the left, you can see um, the three possible arrangements of a tree that can consists of just three terminals. And with a small number of characters and just three terminals, you can map all of the different characters onto these feature trees, count them, and choose the best one. So that's great. However, you can see then, if I add another terminal, so that's a fourth terminal here, the number of um, possible tree shapes that we have increases really quite drastically. And the number of taxa versus the number of um, possible tree shapes that we can have is shown on the right here. And you can see that this actually increases very, very quickly. You reach um, huge numbers of trees very, very uh, quickly that prevents you from doing an exhaustive search, trying every single tree shape for every single um, character and counting them up. That is because um, that by the time you reach less than 100 terminals, in fact, you've got more possible rearrangements of any 
given tree than there are atoms in the universe. And that means that we have to use other approaches when it comes to building our trees. We can't possibly count all of the characters on every potential tree rearrangement. So we turn to computational methods, and in particular, we do something called a heuristic search. This is a school of kind of, of algorithm of searching, which is a method of problem solving where there is no analytical solution, or an analytical so solution is very hard to come by. So this approach, a heuristic approach, involves trial and error, and then iterations of trial and error approaches to try and make sure that we've got the, um, in this case, the shortest tree. So this is, another way of saying that is this is an approach with a, which approximates an answer by subsampling and using search algorithms. And we want to get a good approximation of the answer based on the data that we have. In phylogenetics, it often helps us to visualize different rearrangements of trees and their length as a landscape. So this is what you can see on this diagram here. We've got two um, uh, axes here, the X and the Y, and those just represent all of the different possible tree shapes that we may have um, just collapsed down to two different axes, even though um, in, in reality this is far more axes. The higher you are up on this Z axis, the shorter your tree is, so the closer you are to the most parsimonious tree. And I've usefully got this diagram that marks on the length of two trees here. And essentially, uh, this helps because what we want to do is we want to find this shortest tree, that which implies the fewest character changes, and that means that we want to find this peak. And we can do so by climbing up a hill. So we can do, do use a thing called a hill climbing algorithm. This is making small rearrangements to our tree uh, and keeping those that make the tree shorter and then repeating this process. So always moving upwards towards this peak. So that works really well, that simple hill climbing algorithm on this landscape that you see here where you've got just got one peak and you can always walk uphill to it. However, in any real situation, we'll probably have things that we call local optima. These are basically shorter hills that um, don't quite reach the most parsimonious tree, but they don't allow you to um, traverse from this peak to this peak without going downhill somewhere. So if you want to traverse tree space more widely and make sure that we don't get stuck in a local optimum, make sure that we do reach our, our kind of our global optimum, we can do so by starting these hill climate algorithms in multiple different places. So this is much akin to if you've ever gone climbing up mountains in, uh, in say, uh, Scotland and you get to the, the top of uh, a mountain which you were climbing and you can suddenly see all of the other mountains um, which are uh, kind of like sort of spread out around you. And you can see that some of those may well actually be higher than the peak that you're standing on, but you can't, of course, get to them without going down and then back up another peak. This is exactly the same thing. And so in one of our tree searches, what we do is we mix uh, a tree climbing, sorry, a tree climbing, a hill climbing algorithm with a uh, um, kind of a slightly more bold algorithm that makes sure we start in lots of different places to test all of the possible peaks, or hopefully test all the possible peaks. There are a number of ways we can do this. Um, one example is shown on the left here. So on the left, you can see our hill climbing algorithm. This is a, uh, a, an approach where we um, get the simplest arrangement of three of our taxa. We add a fourth taxon, and then we count all of the possible different rearrangements of that taxon and work out the different steps uh, that are required to um, to, to work out which one is the shortest. We then keep the shortest tree topology. We add the taxon that we have just um, decided which one's the shortest to that tree. Then we add another taxon. And then we count the possible different rearrangements of that new taxon on the tree that we selected from the, uh, the last iteration. And we repeat this um, until we've built up the complete number of terminals. So you're always adding one more terminal, one more taxon, then trying all of the places you can put that and choosing the shortest. If there's a tie, for example, here, you can see two that are 14 steps, then we just choose one of those randomly. And this is called a random addition sequences because normally these are added in a random order. And so by doing that, we're always climbing upwards and this is our tree search algorithm. In order to make sure we start that algorithm in different places, we do that repeatedly and we 
I can either start with completely random trees, so just randomly start um, with a, a, a different set of three and build it up from there, or we can do something called a subtree prune and regraft move. So this is a, a bit where you plonk off a bit of your tree, move it to elsewhere, and then do a hill climbing algorithm from the new tree that you formed by, um, by plonking off this algorithm there. So that allows us to, to traverse tree space more widely with different lengths of tree. And we can combine these two approaches to allow them um, to, to try and make sure that we're searching tree space very, very widely. So this thing, for what it's worth, is called an SPR move. And there are a number of different moves that we can use to allow us to jump around in tree space and then do some more hill climbing and hope we find the most parsimonious tree. So that's great. And I really like these. When I was writing this up, this lecture, I was uh, basically, I was like Marge here. I just think these are really neat. They're really clever approaches to trying to solve a computational problem. So I, I hope you think so too. They're just, they're just super cool. Ideally, of course, we would like to identify just one most parsimonious tree. Reality is rarely so simple, however, and normally we find multiple MPTs. So for example, we might have each of these trees on the left-hand side here, which has 105 character changes in it. So there, in this case, um, there is no reason for us to prefer any single tree because they've got the same length and parsimony doesn't say anything about which one of those may be better than the others. So. Under these circumstances, we summarize all of these trees by creating a thing called a consensus tree. So this is an evolutionary tree containing information that is shared by a number of trees. Typically with parsimony, that's the strict consensus, which contains only monophyletic groups found in all trees. So as you can see, the difference between these trees here is that um, typically uh, D, E, and F have different arrangements in this tree to these two. Therefore, we collapse that down. And similarly, um, in this tree, we can't tell any difference between A, B, and C. They're in a, they're in a thing that is a statement of a, a lack of knowledge that are called a polytomy, because they all meet at a single point. They don't have a, a nested node relationship, and therefore we collapse that down as well in our consensus tree. There are other kinds of consensus tree that we um, won't cover here, but they just they all have different strengths and weaknesses. But this is essentially a way of summarizing our results to allow us to get we hope to the correct, um, to the as close to the correct answer as we can get without having um, contradictory relationships in our tree. So when we um, do science, it's always good to try and reveal and quantify uncertainty, and we can do this in phylogenetics using things called support values. So these are values that we calculate to show how much support any given branch has. There are quite a few ways of um, calculating these, um, but I'm going to introduce two on this slide. The first is a kind of uh, a, a statistical technique that's used more widely called bootstrapping. So this is a method, uh, a method generally in which data from a sample study are used as a surrogate population for calculating the sample distribution of the statistic. So in um, a phylogenetic context, this is actually just the percentage of times a branch is recovered when instead of building the phylogeny from all of the characters, you do so using randomly subsampled characters over many repeats. The lower that number is, the less well supported that particular branch is. Another neat metric, which I've mentioned here, is a thing called Bremer support values. So this is um, a measure support by looking at how many characters unite each branch. And if we were um, it wanted to collapse a branch, how many characters we would have to drop in order to collapse support for that branch. So you can see an example here from an arachnid phylogeny I did one time. And you can see, for example, that these are the spiders. Um, there is relatively good support in terms of bootstrapping for the uh, for the spiders here. They've got 70%, um, a Bremer support value of 1, which isn't brilliant. Uh, in contrast, though, uh, for example, these two uh, extinct arachnids here have a Bremer support value of 28, so that's very, very weak. But again, only, only a Bremer support value of 1. Uh, a well um, supported, a really well supported branch is the um, the schizomids, these creatures that are shown here, which have a Bremer support value of 6 and a bootstrap value of 99. So this allows us to see in different ways the support that any given um, set of relationships has in our phylogeny and which ones we should have more confidence in relative to, um, to others. 
So that's very, very useful. We can use a number of different pieces of software to actually do these um, tree searches that I've mentioned. One is called PALP, so this is a, a recursive name, phylogenetic analysis using PALP, um, which and obviously PALP is then phylogenetic analysis using PALP, etc., um, which is uh, quite old now. It's been around for a, a long time, but lots of people still use it because it's very user-friendly. There's another piece of software called TNT, Tree Analysis Using New Technology, which is used by quite a few people who, who have very large data sets that they want to analyze using parsimony. And if you so wish, you can actually do parsimony searches using the statistical programming language R, because there are lots of packages that allow you to do that. And all of these have their different strengths and weaknesses that you will get to know if you ever happen to be building phylogenies. So a focus of all of that has been um, building trees using this thing called parsimony. And I just wanted to put in a single slide, which does contain some fairly heavy concepts. So I, I don't think you need to be concerned if you don't follow all of this. But I wanted to highlight that there is another way that we can build trees. And that's using a school of approaches, which are called probabilistic. So probabilistic reasoning is a problem solving technique based on the use of probability theory for weighing evidence and inferring conclusions. For our purposes in phylogenetics, there are two probabilistic approaches that we can use. One is called maximum likelihood, and the other is called Bayesian phylogenetics. Both of these have their origin in building molecular trees, but are now being moved through to morphological trees. And I want to quickly highlight in this slide the Bayesian approach, because there have been recent discussions regarding whether this or parsimony creates better trees. So the Bayesian approach to phylogenetic relies on a thing called Bayes' theorem, which is shown here. But essentially all that actually that equation tells you is that this is a way of describing the probability of an event based on prior knowledge of conditions that might be relevant to that event. More specifically, in uh, the world of phylogenetics, we have our data. Those are our characters, either morphological or molecular or both. We often include... Um, in Bayesian phylo phylogenies, fossil ages, um, as another piece of data that we can use. And then we have three models. We have a, a clock model, which describes how the substitution rate or varies or does not across the tree. Uh, we have a tree model, which is um, which describes the process of speciation and extinction and lineage sampling that generate the tree. And we have a substitution model that models how um, characters switch from one state to another. All Bayes', Bayes theorem really does, ignoring the details, is take all of these things, the data and the model, and then allows us to calculate a possibility for any given tree. This is a problem though that can't be solved analytically, much like the parsimony heuristic tree search that we've met, but we can approximate the solution using a thing called an MCMC chain, a Markov chain Monte Carlo. So this is a thing whereby we have, for example, we're once more back to our landscape here. You can see an example of a green tree shape and the probability of that tree being the correct one based on our data and our models. You can then just change the tree a tiny bit, um, for example, and that may make a new tree shape that's more probable or one that's less probable. The way an MCMC chain works is it just um, accepts any change that makes a tree more probable. It accepts any change that makes a tree a little bit less probable to allow us hopefully to travel around local minima, but anything that makes a tree a lot less probable, it ignores. And then there's, there's quite a lot of evidence and math, science and maths that has gone into this that shows that if you have one of these chains, it's actually called this because it doesn't care about the last state of the chain, it just kind of like explores tree space in a probabilistic framework, um, then what happens is that as this chain eventually reaches a standing distribution traveling around tree space where it spends more time on more probable results and less time on less probable results. And we can then just build a picture of the shape of a likely tree by um, taking the more probable tree shapes and summarizing those in a consensus. So that is a very, uh, I guess, a brief introduction to probabilistic methods. But if you ever conduct phylogenetics, um, it's likely you're going to come across this um, approach in a bit more detail. And I wanted to finish by highlighting that fossilization can also have an impact on 
phylogenies, and this is something we need to consider as paleontologists. Almost all morphological phylogenies have missing data, and how we should actually deal with missing data uh, is a question that remains uh, really unsolved after 50 years. It's a bit of a big question. But what we know is worse than random missing data is systematic missing data. And we think fossil preservation can introduce this. So I'm basing this on a paper by my colleague uh, Rob, who in 2010 wrote this beautiful paper that showed that if you decay vertebrate organisms, there's a distinct order in which um, the different uh, bits of the anatomy uh, disappear. If you then code the decaying organism at different states of decay into a phylogeny, the highest levels of decay tend to come out uh, as the earlier branching uh, nodes in a phylogeny. So the things that disappear and decay last are those that we would also use typically to suggest that something is a very um, early branching member of the vertebrates. And Rob called this called a thing called stemward slippage. It may only apply to vertebrates, but it's a thing that we need to be aware of. It could be that when we're looking at the fossil record, we need to remember that we're looking at sometimes quite decayed organisms. Things don't always fossilize immediately. And that could be impacting our picture of where they sit on the tree of life. So I hope this video and this series of videos on phylogeny has been interesting. I hope um, it has inspired you to think about the tree of life a bit more broadly. And I thank you very much for getting to this point in the videos. I will see you sometime soon. Take care.